my talk is about, my talk is about the impact of English only instruction in the English proficiency of ELs. Now I'll give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little about the rationale and uh, the procedural details, the outcomes and the interpretation of the research and my current research that I'm working on. So as most of you know already, and I was telling Christopher that um, I love that I'm speaking to a group of people that are very proficient with um, teaching students a second language. You're, a lot of you, you, this is your area of expertise. So as you're probably aware, there's an increase in the population of ELs in the United States. And the ELs are the fastest growing subpopulation in American education. And more than 60 million children in the US speak another language other than English at home. And along with this, there's a shortage of ESL instructors. And in 2016, 32 states reported a shortage of ESL instructors. And that number still keeps increasing as of now. So if you could please just answer this question in the chat, if you're able to, like, where are you located? And again, like I said, I'm in Massachusetts. So I'm excited to see where people are from. Um, and also what programs do they use to teach English learners in K through 12 classrooms in um, your, your states, if you're not in Florida or wherever you may be. And I will come back to those answers later in a little bit. So in Massachusetts now, what's happened in Massachusetts is that the uh, population of ELs has been increasing. And that's just a graph showing you how that number has increased. And in Massachusetts, what we did in Massachusetts was uh, we had transitional bilingual education from um, like early 50s until 2002. And in Massachusetts, in 2002, Massachusetts actually, um, the people went to the polls and they said, no more um, Spanish and no more bilingual education. We want English only in the classroom. So this was actually propelled and was a political move and it was propelled and people voted at the polls that said no more bilingual education. So from that time, uh, Massachusetts was doing English only in the classroom for all English learners. And in 2003, what happened was that, actually what happened is in about eight years afterwards from that time, 68% um, of teachers in Massachusetts were not even getting trained on how to make the switch from transitional bilingual education to English only instruction. And the program they used was sheltered English immersion. And so after eight years, like I said, 68% of the teachers had not even started training. And the training did not reflect any advances in ESL and there was no need for follow-up supports. And so what happened was the Department of Justice ordered DESE and DESE is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in Massachusetts to design a revised SEI um, training program. So what um, DESE did was they implemented what we call the RETAIL initiative. And RETAIL was the re, is the, called the Rethinking Equity and Teaching for English Learners. Now, ideally, what they said was that every teacher in Massachusetts needs to earn their SEI endorsement. So SEI endorsement just meant that they're taught and they know how to teach students English as a second language. So you have to learn, earn your SEI endorsement before you can even get licensed to teach in Massachusetts. And this was a requirement in, this is still a requirement in Massachusetts to this point. So with the retail, uh, retail came with a couple of initiatives such as um, WIDA can do descriptors. Some of you may be familiar with this. Now what WIDA can do descriptors pretty much they actually um, described English learners at different levels. So we had level one, and that students were entering, level two were beginning, level three developing, and level four expanding, and level five bridging, and level six reaching. So this did not exist in Massachusetts before retail started. And what they did was um, that they at least 
had the what is it can these English learners actually do? So we're not taking it from what can't they do, but what can they do? And every teacher in Massachusetts became a little more has become a little more familiar with the Weeder can do descriptors. Now the Weeder can do descriptors also came with um, with certain strategies that came with the retail initiative, things such as reciprocal teaching, which some of you may know, or partner reading. Um, and seven steps vocabulary strategies, but these were other strategies that teachers were taught or are still taught in order to earn their SEI endorsement. Now, I'm, I'm, I decided to put a couple examples because this is important as far as what my data will show in a little bit in earlier slides. So here's the problem statement. So this was in Massachusetts, right? This is in Western Massachusetts. Now, I was a graduate student when I actually got started on this research. And I was a graduate student. I had experience working in New York City in the Bronx as a New York teaching fellow. I had experience working in Hartford, Connecticut. And I, I was a math teacher, high school math teacher. That's my um, certification area. So I wasn't an English as a second language kind of teacher. But, but I had a lot of experience working in K through 12 classrooms. And so I moved to Western Massachusetts and I got a job working in Western Massachusetts. And I, I said, oh, this will be easy for me. I have so much experience working in K through 12 classrooms. And so I was very thoughtful about the activities, you know, first day activities um, before, after the summer, I was very thoughtful about the activities. I wanted to build a safe classroom environment for my students. And I wanted them to be able to contribute and participate in discussions and feel like they were learning. So that was my goal. And my activities for the first day of class were very simple things such as I gave them index cards and I said, write your name um, and tell me two things you want me to know about you and what did you do over the summer? So ideally, I thought these students would write this on their cards and then they'll share it with other people in small groups. And then this would be a great way to start the school year. That was my idea. So now I am multilingual and I've, I went to school in the US. I've been to school in Zimbabwe. Um, so I was cultural, my cultural identity has been from a number of places. And so when I got this position, I remember the principal said, oh, you'll do so well. You'll do so well with this. This is a good, good, good um, situation for you because we're going to pair you up with English learners. And my goal at that point was I was thinking girls education. That's what I love to do in Africa for research. That was my long term goal at that point. So now what happened the first day of school? The first day of classes, and like I said, I had the little card with the, um, what did you do over the summer? Um, tell me a couple of things about you. So I was at the door and I was shaking the hands of students as they came in, that was pre-COVID. And I was smiling at them and giving them the index cards. And I was like, you should start uh, answering the questions that I have posted on the board. And then I will tell you what to do next. And so I, um, I walked into the class and I remember thinking my students, I had about 26 students in my class. And I remember seeing my students with their cards on the desks and their pens. And I was thinking, do you understand what you're supposed to be doing? Um, I put very simple instructions, just write your name. What did you do over the summer? And the students looked very confused. And I was like, wait, wait, it's very simple. And I should tell you, this was 10th grade geometry class in Western MASH. So they're 10th grade um, and it was a geometry class. And the assumption is that they understood algebra one. We're done with that. You take geometry after algebra one. I mean, after algebra one, yes. And so one girl, I looked at me and said, miss, miss. And she, was she looked confused. And she was like, miss, miss, miss. And I was like, what's the problem? And so I repeated again, write your name. What did you do over the summer? And then she said, miss, 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 I know speak English. And I was like, no, what do you mean you know speak English? And she was like, I know speak English. And I was like, oh, I, I, oh. I was like, you know what? Anybody else in this class who knows speak English? And so I put my hand up and they all raised their hands in the air one at a time. And I just looked and I was like, oh my goodness. 
you this I can't believe this is happening right now. I didn't expect that. I taught English learners before, but I didn't realize that I'll be teaching geometry, high school geometry, to a class of students that could not speak English. And I found out later that the students in my class were students at WIDA level one and WIDA level two. So some of them knew very little English words. And I, I wrote, I'm a spiritual person. I wrote, I believe God brought me to this situation because like I said, in my mind, I was thinking I want girls education in Africa, but then suddenly now I was in a situation where I have to teach geometry to students that could not speak English. So I went to my principal and I said, wait, wait, this doesn't make sense. You didn't tell me that my students cannot speak English at all. They're WIDA one and with level two. And I was told, um, you, the retail is going to help you, the initiative, you're going to get your SEI endorsement. This would be wonderful and, and you will do great. And so I took my classes, the retail classes, and I got my SEI endorsement. And then I started implementing those strategies in my geometry class. And I found the retail strategies to vary greatly in the effectiveness in my own teaching. Um, and we go back to some of the examples I gave with you, the reciprocal teaching, where you have students teaching each other, or maybe you have students text dependent questions. And that's impossible to do if students cannot even speak English. If they, most of them probably had between 10 to 20 words of English on the first day of class. And I began to wonder if these strategies were working for other teachers in Massachusetts, and more importantly, for the English learners at low proficiency levels. Um, and I started asking, because I would ask teachers, have you tried the SEI strategies? How are they working in your classroom? And most of them that kept on telling me, oh, no, they're not working well for us. They're not working well for us. So this led me to my question. So at that point, like I said, again, my research was headed in another direct direction. And then I said, I need to find out if these strategies are actually helpful. So I, I, my question was, is retail effectively addressing the language learning needs of ELs in Massachusetts? Is SEI English only the most effective method to teach ELs? That was my main question um, that I wanted to answer. And I have came up with a couple of research questions. Are more students making progress on the access? Now the access is an English proficiency test in Massachusetts and English learners in Massachusetts K through 12 are required to take this test every year. And ideally students should show growth. So for instance, if they start at WIDA level one, the next time they take it, they should be at WIDA level two which shows that they're actually becoming more proficient in the English language. That's the goal. And my second question was, is there a relationship between the percentage of lower level widow students in ESL programs and the percentage of ELs making progress on the access test? What is the impact of having a greater percentage of ELs at lower widow levels? And this came from my own experience while I was teaching the 10th grade geometry students because I couldn't use those strategies in their classrooms. Um, they just did not work with their abilities as far as they, what they were able to do with the English language. And then the other question I looked at was, is there a relationship between the percentage of teachers in districts who have completed the retail course and the percentage of ELs making progress on the access test? So ideally, not ideally, in theory, you'd think that more teachers have completed the retail course if you've completed the retail course, you're more equipped to teach English learners. Therefore, we should have more students making progress in the access. And that's what one would think. So these are the main questions that I looked at. And the design, um, I designed this as a quantitative analysis and I used SPSS. And my analysis was divided into three categories, descriptive analysis, I investigated relationships using correlations, and I looked at the variance, multilinear regression, and ANOVA, and I got data from the Department of Justice um, to help me go through this research. So here are the outcomes. Now, the first question, are more students making progress on the access test since the inception of retail? And like I said, one would think, oh, surely they are making progress. But I, from my experience, was like, I don't think they're making progress because my classroom students, 
could not use the strategies. I didn't even know what to do with the strategies. They were confused with the strategies. They were not, they did not understand the strategies. So I analyzed the data and this is what I got from the data. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to just glance through those numbers. So now from the data, now the data, I looked at the scores for all the English learners in Massachusetts. And from my data, it showed that the percentages of students making progress on the access was actually increasing. So the results indicated a significant difference across the four years from, um, as you can see, the numbers 61, 57, 64, then 69.81 in 2016. And I thought, this is impossible. This can't be accurate. How can this be? The numbers are going up, but I've heard from teachers that these strategies are not working. They can't even use them. So how could this be the case? So the next thing I looked at was, is there a relationship between the percentage of lower level students in an ESL program and the percentage of ELs making progress on the access test? What is the impact of having a percentage of ELs at lower reader levels? So I said, let me look at this. Has it applied specifically to students at reader, lower reader levels? And I did a correlation analysis now this analysis was very useful this was for the relationships now it showed me that els at the lower weta levels and those are the lower weta though remember the weta can do descriptors that i showed you students from levels one to three the students that i had in my classroom their results correlated negatively with improvement on the access while the els at higher weta levels levels four to six correlated positively with the improvement on the access. So this made more sense to me because I thought this is what I saw in my classroom. We couldn't use the strategies. So how could it be that those numbers are increasing anyway? But for the students at higher WIDA levels, there was a positive correlation uh, with the access scores. And that's just a chart showing you what those numbers look like. So now with this chart here, what I did was I looked at the population percentages of students at lower and higher WIDA levels in Massachusetts. So I found out that over those four years, what has happened is that the population of students at higher WIDA levels has actually been increasing in Massachusetts, whereas the population of students at lower WIDA levels has been decreasing. And so I was like, huh, that possibly explains it. So it's not that overall that the scores of um, English learners at, at has been increasing, but also the percentages of students at different reader levels has changed. So because of that, the increase of the mean percentage of students making progress on the access, like I said, it coincides with the degree of the percent the decrease in the percentages of ELs at lower WIDA levels in ESL programs in Massachusetts. So you cannot distinguish whether the increase in the percentage of students making progress in the access test is solely as a result from the retail initiative. And if this increase is a decrease, is a result of the decrease in the population of students at lower WIDA levels. And so this is what I think um, that data actually shows. Now, second question was that, is there a relationship between the percentage of teachers in districts who have completed the retail course and the percentage of ELs making progress on the access? So like I mentioned, one would think, right, you have more teachers that have completed the retail and have earned the SEI endorsement and they're prepared for English only instruction in the classroom. So that makes sense that you would think that more students are doing better with the access from those schools or those districts. So this graph here, the first thing it shows, it shows you the cumulative percentage of teachers who've completed the retail. 
Now, if you remember in a slide earlier, I showed you that after eight years, 68% of the teachers in Massachusetts had not even started being trained for SEI and they were not familiar with what it actually entails and they were not required to do it. But as a result of retail, the population of students that have act, of um, teachers that have actually uh, completed retail and earned their SEI endorsement has increased. So this is substantially better than uh, what we had earlier. So retail has been useful in this regard. And this is showing the cumulative percentages of teachers again. So those numbers have been increasing. Now the next question, like I said, I wanted to see whether there's a relationship between the percentage of teachers in districts who have completed the retail course and the percentage of ELs making progress on the access. Now with this one, with this one, um, I found out that in 2014 and 2015, the percentage of teachers correlated negatively with improvement on access. While in 2013 and 2016, it showed no significant relationship. So this shows that districts that actually have more teachers that have completed the retail actually have less students making progress on the access. And I thought this doesn't make sense because more teachers should be trained to go through with English only instruction and they're using English in the classroom. So why is it that students are actually doing worse in districts and schools um, that teachers have been trained in? It just does not make sense. Now, the other thing I looked at, which helps understand this a little further is I did a multilinear regression analysis now I found out that up to 77% of the variability in the percentage of students making progress on the access test could be associated by a couple, um, by, by, by the following um, linear, by a linear relationship between the following factors. You have the ELs enrolled in the program, the percentage of students at the lower WIDA level and the cumulative percentage of teachers who completed re the retail. So up to 77% of um, the students, percentage of students making progress on the access can actually be explained by this specific factors. I found out that um, among ESL programs with the same number of EL students enrolled and the same percentage of teachers who have successfully completed the retail course, after adjusting for the percentage of students at low reader levels, the predicted percentage of student making progress on the access test decreased by up to 64%. So this actually shows that the percentage of students at low reader level has a greater impact on the percentage of students making progress on the access. And this is was surprising. This is not quite what people expected, but this again was my experience in the classroom as I was trying to use those reader strategies to SEI strategies to students in my classroom. And I also found out that among ESL programs with the same number of EL students enrolled and the percentage of students at lower reader level, after adjusting for the percentage of teachers who have successfully completed the retail course, the predicted percentage of students making progress on the access test also decreased by 26%. And again, that's another surprise, decreasing, decreasing, which does not make sense. You would think more teachers have been trained, so more teachers know how to help English learners make progress with English. So the results suggest the following. Um, they suggest that ELs at lower reader levels do not have the adequate resources to attain high rates of success in English language proficiency. So that was my experience with those students in the geometry class that I started talking about in the beginning. It was my experience that the retail strategies require the use of CULP, which is a more cognitively demanding skill that requires at least five to seven years to attain. 
And my experience when I was teaching the students in the classroom, I was a geometry teacher. And at that time, and this is gonna change a little bit, but I was a geometry teacher and I was told at that time, not only are you now teaching geometry, but you're teaching geometry and the English language at the same time to the students. And then you're preparing them for standardized tests. So I was a math teacher and an English language teacher which is what happens to a lot of teachers in Massachusetts when they're in an SEI um, English, pro SEI ELL program. They have to teach the language alongside with the content. And I believe from that time that um, the use of SEI has the main type of instruction that's English only instruction um, for English learners is impeding the education of English learners at lower reader levels because ELs at lower reader levels for instance, I'm able to learn content literacy. Again, think about my class, my geometry math class, where the students have to learn the English before they can even pick up the geometry. And so we stuck, we're stuck in a lot of the English. We didn't quite get to the geometry piece yet. And a lot of um, English learners in such programs are unable to learn content literacy because they have to attain the English proficiency prior to understanding the content instruction in English. So these are the results, um, the suggestions from my research. Now, the limitation with this research was that the number of teachers who completed the retail course was acquired from DESI, DESI, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in Massachusetts. And these data only represent individuals who were employed in school districts in Massachusetts while completing the retail. And it's possible that some new teachers received the SEI endorsement course while enrolled in college. And it's possible that some teachers with SEI endorsement no longer work in school districts. Now, what happened in Massachusetts, which beyond exciting, was in 2017. So I did my research for my PhD and just right as I finished my research and I got the results of the retail, I found out alongside that Governor Baker in Massachusetts, when I did my research, there were only, there were three states in the US that were doing English only instruction for, um, for English learners. I believe it was California, Massachusetts and Arizona. And so in 2017, November 22nd, Governor Baker passed a new act. It's called an act relative to language opportunity for our kids. And now what this means in Massachusetts from that time, it allows districts to establish the English learner programs they deem best to meet the needs of their students. So you can do sheltered English immersion, the SEI if you want, or you can do a two-way immersion, or you can do transitional bilingual, or you can do other options. So at least now it's no longer illegal to have um, bilingual instruction in the classroom, which is what it was until 2017 when things changed. Now, since that time, I did further research and I'm still doing research, research as of June, 2021, about 5% of the 400 school districts in Massachusetts were using transitional bilingual and or dual language programs. So 95% of the districts in Massachusetts still use SEI sheltered English, English only as the main language acquisition program. And furthermore, the majority of districts with transitional bilingual and or dual language programs also use SEI in most of their schools. So they will have just one school in the district that does transitional bilingual or dual language, but the other schools will continue on with SEI. And it seems like Massachusetts now has flexibility, um, but they're still not affording English learners an opportunity for learning, especially in K through 12 classrooms. So my current research now is I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see how schools are responding to this change. Like I said, only 5% of them had, may have made the switch. And I wonder why. And um, I'm also curious whether the performance on ELs on the perform, I'm, I'm, I'm exploring the performance of ELs on access in ESL programs that use um, SEI, that's the English only one instruction compared to transitional bilingual and dual language programs. Now I've done a little research over the summer looking at 
data regarding the numbers, but what I would like to do now is I actually want to visit the schools in Massachusetts that are using bilingual or dual language programs. I want to see what it is that's actually, like what, what, what environment are they creating for their students? Because I think that um, they're most likely, they're probably shaping a safe, creating a safe environment that's allowing students to feel more comfortable sharing um, than other students in SEI programs, English only programs. But I, I don't know yet. So that's what I'm looking forward to doing next year. Post COVID, hopefully I'll be able to visit schools um, when, when we're in a safer, safer situation to do that. So I put a question here, and if you could please answer. Um, what I know some people are, are from other states, what, and some people may be more um, knowledgeable of bilingual and dual language programs. What do you think makes a good or effective bilingual or dual language program? Because Massachusetts, we don't have experience with this. Only 5% of the districts are using bilingual dual language programs. The majority are still using English only instruction. Um, so if you could please answer, if you have anything to share about what you think makes a good or effective bilingual or dual language program, I greatly appreciate it. And this is the last slide for my presentation. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions on top of that, I see some people have uh, written in the chat. Thank you. Um, someone in Ohio and someone in Northern Virginia. And there's a mix of pushing and pull out instruction and some dual language immersion programs. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you, Sheila, for um, writing in the chat. So I haven't seen any more messages come through the chat. Did you want to open up the floor if anyone wants to come off mute for any further discussion as well? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so everyone, if you have anything you'd like to discuss, you uh, have the ability to unmute yourself as well. And I just saw that Kate, um, Kate just wrote that she taught SEI to teachers in Arizona in 2004. Thank you for sharing that, Kate. And I believe, Kate, actually Arizona is, is one of the, is the only state that's still doing English only, I believe, um, because I, I just saw that California in 2016 also made the switch to offer flexibility uh, for English learners in K through 12 classrooms. So from my understanding, only Arizona is the only one left doing um, English only in public schools in the US. Oh, Kate is no longer in Arizona. That's okay, Kate. Thank you for sharing. Now, what would you think for those uh, who may want to share, what would you think makes up, makes a good or effective bilingual or transition or dual language program? Hi, this is Kathy in Virginia. Yes, Kathy. Uh, thank you so much for this interesting presentation. It's 
sometimes um, a bit disheartening that we, you know, keep going around in circles with these issues uh, across decades, across states, across across changing policies and laws. Um, so I'm not sure if this, you know, quite answers your question, but I heard a presentation recently at Virginia uh, TESOL in which a group of uh, a teacher educator actually inspired his graduate students in a teacher education program to advocate for the seal of biliteracy that was available for mainly English only uh, speaking students who had taken lots of years of world language study during their middle school and high school experience and were earning uh, the seal of biliteracy because they had completed so much coursework in French or Spanish or German, Italian, whatever language they studied. But all of the uh, multilingual learners languages in the school and their knowledge about their own language wasn't recognized um, as being uh, worthy of the seal of biliteracy. So uh, to answer the question partially is uh, one to in our in our schools to recognize the heritage languages of the multilingual learners who are filling our schools um, as also being bilingual people uh, who should be who should be recognized and uh, not seen to need to drop that that proficiency or use of their uh, language or languages to be replaced by English, but just to recognize the worthiness. And one way that could happen in a school is for schools to allow the seal of biliteracy that's across many states now uh, to have students who, so they what they did was they advocated for their study of English because they're taking English language development and also English coursework uh, to count as their additional language and thereby still be allowed to obtain the seal of biliteracy. So I thought that was just pretty cool advocacy um, in recognizing multilingual learners yeah. strengths and speakers as other languages than English. Yes, Kathy, thank you for sharing that. And in Massachusetts, they actually now also do the seal of biliteracy. Uh, which is which is a wonderful thing, which like you said, we would have thought just makes sense, right? And so I actually, some students that are coming, coming from high school now, they will boldly say, I have the seal of biliteracy, and they also get a waiver for the fallen language in college, which does make sense because they are biliterate. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm, 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 thank you for sharing your experience with us. Kathy. Sure, thank you. I have a question. I'm not myself an educator, so I don't have as much context for this. Um, but I was surprised to hear that there were only, it sounds like at the height of it, three states that were doing only SEI by policy. Yeah. Would you say it's maybe also accurate to say that more states are de facto only SEI? Um, I don't have a good sense for sort of the landscape nationally, uh, but I was being from the South in particular, very surprised to hear no Southern states on that list. Hmm. That's an interesting question, actually. Um, but but that I think that's a good as, assumption to make that they probably just assume that SEI is the way to go, although people have the flexibility. And like I said with the data, right, um, Christopher, that in Massachusetts they now have the flexibility, but only five percent of the school districts have actually made the switch to something else. So now it's no longer illegal to go with um, bilingual or dual language, but still most schools are continuing on with the English only instruction. 
So I, I think it's just the way people are going to continue to go with it unless they um, take the initiative or teachers and instructors take the initiative to, to actually come against it more because we now have freedom to use other programs but we still need resources in different states and different cities um, to actually be able to set up the dual language programs or bilingual um, programs for English learners. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with that, but at least we know now that's okay. Christopher, I'm not sure if I answered your question with that. Did I, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. We do have seven more minutes in this session, if there are any final questions. Actually, I have another question for people. Um, I'm thinking about doing qualitative analysis and possibly doing some focus groups and interviews um, and observing some classrooms. Um, what do people think I should look out for? Things that may be useful to uh, pay attention to in the classroom or even when people are speaking. Because my, a lot of my research is quantitative, normally with numbers. So I'm not even quite sure what themes I'm going to get from qualitative research. Any suggestions would be great. So, uh, Yoki, what, what would your what would your research be focused on? I want to see what's happening in transitional bilingual or dual language programs. Um, what kind of um, a environment they're creating for English learners, and how that differs from students in SEI English only programs. Mm. And I also am curious whether teachers have um, enough support in um, transitional bilingual and um, dual language programs. I'm, I'm. That's that's kind of like what I want to I want to investigate further. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, qualitatively, it would seem like you might want to focus on just the features of asset-based approaches or uh, ways that teachers practice culturally and linguistically sustaining practices. Uh, as in the session this morning, we were talking about translanguaging practices and perhaps how much opportunity there is for, for students to move across their language repertoires to learn and apply their their languages as language or languages as uh, learning tools. I don't know, just a few, just a few thoughts. Um, reading a little bit about, for example, dual language programs and some inequities there are kind of, uh, you know, often located in communities where most of the children who attend may already be um, more privileged children and not so much access for the minoritized community of learners who are not the students who they do speak another language in their home language practices, but they're not the students who are filling the, the dual language immersion school. 
it's it's a it's a giant uh, field with lots of possibilities. So I'm excited for you, and I wish you I wish you good luck. Thank thank you, Kathy. Um, th this is very helpful, um, and I'm going to really look more into the asset based approach because I've heard it um, several times by other people in other groups today. So I'm really going to look more into that. So thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. And I see Tyra wrote, um, she suggests using the methods to inform each other, uh, focus groups to inform the observations, then observations to create questions to ask in the focus groups. That's a good suggestion, Tyra. Thank you very much. So we do have just a couple of more minutes if there are any concluding thoughts anyone would like to share. Actually, I have a question for Tyra. Um, Tyra, I have a question with focus groups. So I'm, I'm thinking about doing focus groups. How large do you think focus groups should be? How many people do you think should be in a group? I'm not sure if you've if you've done any focus groups yet? It, it depends on what kind of group you want. Um, in general, the size matters less than the composition because you want the people to be comfortable enough to be honest. So generally something under 20 uh, is to strive for. You don't want a large group where people don't feel they can talk. Um, but if it's going to be something that feels like they are revealing things to other people, you might want to go smaller and do a group of six or you know seven uh, to get information. And I found that I use the methods to inform each other. So the first three or four focus groups are really about figuring out what will work best for the research and helping to craft that final like sort of question you want to use for the focus groups you use for the research. Thank you, Tyra. This is very helpful. Thank you. I'll just share one more thing. This is Kathy. Um, yes. That really makes a lot of sense. And I like that idea of having the focus groups inform the observations and the observations then you know create the questions. One other thing to think about size-wise is the amount of data okay. that you're going to collect and how you're going to organize and analyze and make sense of that data. It can be quite overwhelming if it's um, interview-based, that's kind of lengthy answers, uh, then you don't want to have so much data that it's almost impossible to analyze it coherently and organize it in a way that is useful. Yes, um, thank you, Kathy. I have, this is a new um, research method for me. So I know I, I probably still have a lot to learn. So if anyone has any suggestions, I put my email in there because I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about approaching the research this way, but I also know there's a lot I don't know yet. So if you have any suggestions to help me, um, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Tyra, for helping me and this will be very helpful with my research, the next part where I'm going. So thank you. All right, so with that, our time for this session is up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Ine, and thank you to all of our participants for the great discussion in this session and for being with us uh, throughout the day at our conference today. Um, so we hope to see you in our concluding session. But again, thank you everyone so much for your continued support of Watisol. Thank you.